I'm not sure what's worse, being uh, the last speaker uh, between you and lunch or between you and a group, group photo. But uh, uh, clearly, uh, I will try and do what I can to keep it brief. But first of all, uh, may I thank uh, our co-hosts, uh, the uh, ministers both of New Zealand and Australia, uh, Your Excellency Murray uh, McCulley and uh, Your Excellency Julie Bishop, uh, also to the Prime Minister of Tuvalu, His Excellency Enos Sabaka, and uh, the uh, Premier of Nui, His Excellency Toki Telagi, uh, as well as my good friend Mr. Alaj Asi and my colleague Helen Clark, who's just spoken so well. Um, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and, and colleagues, I'm very pleased I don't actually have to introduce myself, because you can see the job title is so huge, I don't think I've got the capacity to take a deep enough breath to get through it. Um, and that's seemingly the problem since I took on this role three weeks ago uh, and trying to explain the uh, position I've joined. I can never quite get to the end of the job title, but I'm, uh, I've explained it. But I do want to welcome and thank you all for coming to uh, this seventh regional consultation in preparation uh, for, first, the crescendo of these global consultations in, uh, in Geneva. This is a really fundamentally important uh, regional uh, conference and consultation because uh, it's the seventh out of eight, uh, but importantly, it does have this unique quality of representing the Pacific uh, challenges and opportunities, uh, which are so important to have that voice heard within our broad uh, sweep right across the world of seeking to engage as many stakeholders as we possibly can to get this genuine, inclusive consultation process. And so many of the challenges that have come our way have been very much to say we need our voice heard and this really is both the designed opportunity as well as uh, the chance so thank you all very much indeed for coming and making sure that you make that a reality and it's from there that we will be able to take uh, so many of the sharing of best practice and of the knowledge and the expertise the experience uh, the problems as well as the opportunity uh, through that uh, important Geneva meeting in October, and then we will take that all the way through to our World Humanitarian Summit in May. And of course, I'm delighted that the governments of New Zealand and Australia have agreed to co-host this meeting, but I'm very, very pleased also to, to see so many partners, and I think that word partnership is absolutely fundamental to what we're talking about uh, here today as well. That's not just governments, but also regional governments, regional organizations, and region for this particular part of the world is going to be a really fundamental uh, area of learning. I really hope that you'll be able to explain to us what really works at a regional level and how you make that work. Civil society and NGOs, humanitarian practitioners, and very importantly, the private sector, particularly as the private sector is even more visible in uh, areas of natural emergency and disaster uh, than naturally one might expect uh, so often in the conflict settings. And uh, above all, I'm really, really pleased to see people who are affected by crises are here today to give us their testimony. Uh, it is ultimately, uh, responding to the challenge from the Premier of Nui, it is how we all feel, and that is that we are accountable to the affected peoples, and that's what drives our motivation and our action. And it is together that we will be able to set a future agenda for humanitarian action, emphasis on the word action. So, as you've heard, the stakes are high. Around the world, humanitarian needs are overwhelming our capacity to respond. Just six months into 2015, the United Nations is seeking to provide life-saving assistance and protection to 78.9 people across 37 countries. This is nearly double the number of people targeted by UN-coordinated appeals just 10 years ago. And this trend shows no sign of reversing. Around the world, more than 59.5 million people are now forcibly displaced. This is a crisis of forced migration on a scale that we've not seen since the Second World War, with record numbers of people forced to flee their homes as a result of persecution, of conflict, and of violence. The United Nations Secretary General has called for governments and societies around the world to recommit to providing refuge and safety to those who are displaced. And the majority of these people are fleeing conflict, but other factors also play a role. The impact of climate change, population growth, environmental degradation, resource scarcity and natural disasters increase people's vulnerability to disasters and conflicts and put increasing numbers of people on the move, including irregular migrants, and migrants as millions of people seek safety. By 2050, 
Up to one billion people could be displaced by the effects of climate change, including more frequent and intense weather events. Most of us cannot imagine a future in which our ancestral homes could be washed away by a storm. Yet it is precisely this which is already happening to low-lying and coastal communities here in the Pacific region. We have so much to understand and learn from you. Apart from the terrible human costs of natural disasters, the economic costs are staggering. Estimated economic losses due to natural disasters worldwide may now be as high as 300 billion US dollars a year, and those are only expected to increase. Now, the Pacific, as you all know, is one of the most disaster-prone regions of the world. People are still recovering from tropical cyclone PAM, as we've been hearing, which caused widespread destruction across Vanuatu, in particular Tuvalu, Kiribati, and the Solomon Islands, and Typhoon Maysak, which struck the Federated States of Micronesia. The relative scale of these disasters is staggering. In Vanuatu, which according to the World Risk Index is the country with the greatest risk of disaster worldwide, as we heard, some 190,000 people were affected by Cyclone Pam. That is nearly 70% of the population. Now, flash floods like those that hit the Solomon Islands last year, droughts, increased outbreaks of diseases, food insecurity, and rising sea levels erode people's resilience and make them more vulnerable. Yet many of these risks are predictable, which means that we can do more to prepare and protect people from their effects. So colleagues, mitigating and adapting to climate change, as we've heard, are among the great tests of our time. And progress is being made around the world. The number of deaths caused by natural disasters has fallen dramatically compared to 10 or even five years ago. Improved weather forecasting and early warning systems, combined with advances in telecommunications, better connectivity and evacuation plans, have saved thousands of lives in the last year alone. In the Pacific, the Philippines and India, to name a few. As many who know what I was like when I was a development minister in the United Kingdom, I became known as the but for minister. If only we could prove the counterfactual of all that we have done and how many, therefore, how many lives saved, how many deaths have been averted, then we would have so much more of a, uh, an easy story to tell. But it is difficult to prove the counterfactual, but we are doing collectively a huge amount of good uh, which we need to build on and to understand. The work of governments and national disaster management offices in increasing disaster preparedness and coordinating humanitarian response in this region, with support from example the Pacific Humanitarian Team, is commendable. And I would like to uh, pay tribute to Judy Bishop having announced her $2 million uh, humanitarian uh, innovation. Uh, I think you said it was a, um, a plan, a change? Challenge. challenge, that's right. Well, if that's HIC, HIC, let's hope it becomes HIP and uh, becomes a plan. I think that would be great to see that come through, and I'm delighted you've uh, had that initiative today. Thank you. A regional mechanisms for early warning, such as the Pacific Tsunami Warning System and the Melanesian Volcano Network, are reducing disaster risk. Civil military cooperation amongst governments in the region and innovative partnerships with private sector organizations are contributing to more effective humanitarian response, helping to improve transport, logistics, and telecommunications in the aftermath of a crisis. This region has also pioneered innovative models of risk financing, such as the Pacific Catastrophe Risk Assessment and Financing Initiative. As in all regions around the world, it's ordinary men and women who are the first responders to any crisis, and they go to extraordinary lengths to help their communities. And I would just add that Helen was absolutely right to put front and central that it's women who are often not only at the forefront of dealing with those crises, but they are the most vulnerable and the ones who bear the greatest brunt. And I think designing women and girls front and center in all our response, whether it's in humanitarian or development and all that goes with it, is absolutely both vital, necessary, and unchallengeable. The role of civil society groups, including the National Red Cross Societies, is equally important. The people and communities of this region have demonstrated incredible resilience in their ability to cope and rebuild after disasters, including the tragic earthquake in Christchurch in 2010. The 2013 tsunami that struck the Solomon Islands, Vanuatu and New Caledonia, and of course, Typhoon Maysak and Cyclone Pam earlier this year, as was mentioned.
It is precisely this resilience that humanitarian action must encourage and support in order to deal with the challenges of the future. These challenges include the effects of climate change, but they extend to the crisis of protecting civilians in conflict and the growing gap between humanitarian needs and the funds available to meet them. Two weeks ago, I released the status report on this year's global humanitarian appeal. We have received a total of US dollars 4.8 billion out of the 18.8 billion we requested, leaving a shortfall of US dollars 14 billion. Halfway through the year, global humanitarian action is just 26% funded, the lowest figure ever. Now, I said earlier that progress is being made, but it is not being made fast enough. And for that, we run the risk of being judged by history as the generation that did too little too late. The World Humanitarian Summit, together with the framework on disaster risk reduction adopted in March this year, the financing for development meeting in Addis that Helen re referred to, the agreement on a new sustainable development agenda in se September, the high-level panel on humanitarian financing due to report in November, and the climate change meeting in Paris in December, again as we've heard repeatedly, provide us with a unique opportunity to change that. So in Istanbul next year, building on what we will have done in October in Geneva, we must set an ambitious forward agenda for humanitarian action. We must not waste this opportunity to create a more coherent approach that embraces both sustainable development and investment in disaster risk reduction, preparedness and response. The summit, which in addition to the most important and modern toolkit, which I hope we will have unearthed and present in Geneva, is a fantastic opportunity because not only can it, but it really must re-inspire generations to, and reinvigorate everyone involved in the humanitarian community and beyond with the fundamental tenets of our work. It needs to be a global rallying call for humanity, putting principles and the affected people at the very center of our response. It will initiate a set of actions and new technologies so that people, countries and communities are better prepared for and able to respond to current and future crises. And I think it's really important that let us be clear about this, and I speak now as somebody who's in the UN, I'm no longer part of any kind of domestic political or elected position as I was. This needs to be backed by total immutable political, and that's with a small p, global will. And that's where we need to re-inspire new generations to get behind this humanitarian action which is forming part of our overall response as partnerships around the world for improving lives and saving lives. So over the next three days, we must speak openly about these challenges, but we must first and foremost think about the way forward. We have this chance to transform the way we work and create a diverse and truly inclusive global humanitarian system. This is not some form of bid and offer process. This is a summit. This is deliberately designed to draw together all the voices, experiences, technologies, practical solutions together to rise to be the very best that we can be to meet that, those challenges. And I am really struck that this region can tell and teach the world a lot. I'm listening, I'm learning, and I'm determined that together over these next three days, we'll make this a regional consultation that nobody will be able to ignore and everybody will be listening to. Thank you.